Greetings, everyone. Dr. Brian Scott with you again today. We're wrapping up this week. Today's Friday, and it's the second day of February. So welcome to February. This is Insights to the endtimes.com podcast. And we have been sharing these podcasts for close to two years now. We're looking at all kinds of biblical verses, all types of scripture that talk about the end of the age, that talk about what's coming. Revelation talks about seven years of tribulation and all the wrath of God being poured out. It also talks about uh, the evil that will be uh, uh, conducted by the Antichrist, and it leads up to the Battle of Armageddon when all the uh, followers of Antichrist are going to be eliminated in one day, and Jesus Christ will be uh, sitting on the throne. He's going to take over, and he'll rule and reign in peace for a thousand years. We're getting very close to that. A lot of our previous podcasts have addressed this. In fact, if you were to go back into last week, we talked a great deal about the timing where we are. We can't tell exactly. We have acknowledged that, but we can tell you that we're very, very close. This last couple of days, I've been looking with you at scriptures that could be called scary in this respect. The question has been, Will you qualify for the pre-tribulation rapture? Will you be able to be removed from this earth before God's wrath begins to be poured out in the seven years of tribulation? The answer is maybe, hopefully, but you must meet the standards that God has set for us. We started off earlier this week by looking at the standards that Noah met when he was removed from the earth by way of the ark and then returned after God's wrath had been concluded, God sent a flood and eliminated everything, except for Noah, his his seven family members, and the animals on the ark. Four things they said about Noah. He was just, he was perfect in in, in all his ways, or perfect in his generation. He walked with God, and God called him righteous. Enoch was removed from the earth by way of rapture, God called, said about him, he pleased me, he pleased me. So those are, those are standards that we might have to meet or we should meet to be uh, ready for the rapture of the church. We need to be born again. We need to be just. We need to be walking perfectly with God, enduring to the end. We need to be righteous, amen, and we have to be walking with the Lord, amen. Praise the Lord. So Yesterday and the day before, I looked at scriptures, which I don't really want to look at too much, but they, they talk about the things that will disqualify us. We looked at the 10 virgins. Half of them were disqualified. Why? They weren't ready. They weren't walking with the Lord properly. They didn't have enough oil in their lamps, which refers to the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. In other words, they were care, careless, casual, I go to church when I want to. I read my Bible when I want to. I act like a Christian when I want to, but don't get in my way. (laughs) Hallelujah. And then we looked at um, verses in Ephesians and in Galatians where Paul, the apostle, said these things will disqualify you. So let's continue today. I don't mean to, to, to be scaring you, but these are verses. In the book of Romans, Paul's writing the church there, If you start in verse 18, read to the end, you're going to find a lot of things that uh, will uh, point out where you should not be. But in verse 18, it says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Uh, I would suggest to you that this has crept into the church North American church and into North American believers to the point where they are quite um, at ease with operating in ungodliness and unrighteousness. It doesn't phase them. It doesn't bother them. They're probably even getting commendation from their leadership. That's what really scares me. Here's verse 21. Although they knew God... They did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. They professed to be wise, yet they became fools. So 
how about a church member who has uh, been following the Lord and flowing with other church members in, in, in that, their setting, who all of a sudden decides they know more than God and they, they profess to hear from God and they make decisions contrary to God's word, they fall into this category. They profess to be very wise. I'm hearing from God. But they're very foolish because they're causing God to violate his own word. How dumb is that? That's dumb. Here's another verse, 24 and 26. God gave these kind of people over to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts and gave them up to vile passions. So they adopt things outside of God as their focus and as their direction. Verse 28, God gives these people over to a debased mind, and they end up doing things which are not fitting. Who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, they practice things that are deserving of death. Folks, do not fall into these verses. Do not fall prey to these verses. Stay out of these verses. Do not do these kinds of things. Listen to what the Bible is saying. Hallelujah. you got to live your life according to God's standards, not your standards. One last set of verses, and this one's really heavy duty, and we have examined this set of verses in many episodes back a year or so ago. With me, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, In the last days, perilous times will come. And then in the next five or six verses, the Apostle Paul lists 24 things that are going to be perilous for you in your life. Let me read a few of them to you, maybe all of them. In verse 2, it says, men will become lovers of themselves. Wow. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents and or leadership, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, they will slander, they operate without self-control, they're brutal, they're despisers of good, they're haters or traitors, I should say. They're headstrong. Boy, do we ever run into that a lot. Headstrong. I know more than you. I know what I'm saying. I know what I'm saying is true. You can't tell me any differently. I don't care that you might be the minister, the pastor, the priest, but I know more than you. Headstrong. Haughty. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. In other words, my self-interests are more important than God's interests. So don't tell me what I can't do. I'm going to do it anyways. Number five, verse five, having a form of godliness. They know all the terms. They know all the phrases. They sound like really good believers, but they have absolutely no power. That's where most Christians, I hate to say this, but I've observed this for so many years. They have a form of godliness. They know the phraseology. They know the idioms. They know the statements. But there's no power in their life whatsoever. And Paul tells us, from such people turn away. He then goes on to say uh, in verse 7, they are, never, they are always learning, but they're ne never, ever able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Wow. Verse uh, 8, <clears throat> it's talking about Janus and John Brace who resisted Moses, this is Old Testament reference, and that says, so they, so do these also resist the truth. These are men of corrupt minds, disapproved concerning the faith. Um, you got to stay away from people like this. So what am I saying to you? We had six things in Ephesians 5. We had eight, 15 things in Galatians 5. We have, uh, I don't know, I don't know the number, didn't even count the number in Romans, but a, a lot of points there and 24 points here in Timothy. Start adding those up. That's like 24, 6, 30, 45 points plus Romans telling us these are things that will disqualify you from heaven. So what do you need to be? Like Noah, you need to be just. You need to be perfect in your generation. You need to walk with God. You need to be called righteous by God. You need to be pleasing to God. How do you rate? I want you to make heaven. Let's clean up our acts. Amen. Amen.